Hi, welcome to the session. This is State of the TKG Art, where we're going to compare the three different versions of Tanza Kubernetes Grid that VMware currently has. My name is Robert. I'm a consultant for ITQ. I specialize in modern applications and in the Tanzu portfolio. So the standard disclaimer, I've added a line. Um, since I do not work for VMware, my um, views and opinions are not necessarily aligned with those of VMware. So Kubernetes is still hard. We used to say Kubernetes was hard because it was hard to install. Anyone who's tried Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way um, can attest to that. But the hardness of installing Kubernetes itself has mostly been solved now. There are plenty of solutions out there that, that will install Kubernetes for you, um, mostly automatically. Um, but Kubernetes is still hard for a different reason. Um, for most developers, Kubernetes kind of still looks like this. Um, but in the real world, especially in the on-premises enterprise environment, you need quite a bit more to actually productize Kubernetes and productize the application architectures you want to run on Kubernetes. So companies like VMware and the public cloud providers have been developing services around Kubernetes um, to answer all of these different uh, challenges. VMware calls this the Tanzu portfolio. And this is my overview of the Tanzu portfolio. In this presentation, we're gonna focus just on the bottom part of this. We're gonna focus on the Kubernetes runtime itself, which VMware calls Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. Now, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid is an example of a managed Kubernetes solution. What is managed Kubernetes? Well, like I said, you want a, a managed Kubernetes to make the installation of Kubernetes as easy as possible. Um, but you need more than just Kubernetes. You'll, you'll need some networking around it to enable pod-to-pod -pod networking. You'll need an external load balancer to get traffic into your cluster. You uh, might want to integrate with an, some kind of authentication mechanism. Uh, some managed Kubernetes solutions come with an integrated container registry. So what's, it, what's included differs per product. This is kind of what I see as the minimum you'd need from what I'd call a managed Kubernetes solution. Now, VMware has three different managed Kubernetes solutions. The core technology, kind of the, the basic version of, um, of the most modern two of these three solutions is called Tansu Kubernetes Grid. It's the one on the left. This is um, a standalone product. Um, VMware um, position it as um, compatible with, with any cloud, uh, which, uh, which is more or less uh, the case. Um, We'll refer to this version as TKGM. M stands for multi-cloud. This is the informal name that also VMware uses internally for this version of TKG. And then there's Visu with Tanzu. And Visu with Tanzu is when you take TKG and you embed it inside vSphere. This was actually the first version of TKG that was announced. You might remember it as Project Pacific. The core technology is the same as in TKG, but it's embedded in vSphere, which enables some extra capabilities. And it's also wrapped up in the vSphere UI. So some of the installation and use around TKG in this context is maybe slightly easier and more streamlined than if you just use the raw TKG, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, TKGM. TK, um, Visio Tanzu is abbreviated as TKGS very often, again, internally, sometimes externally. Um, this is to differentiate these two different versions and they are quite different. And that's what this talk is about. And we'll get into that. And then the final version is a bit of the odd one out. It's the oldest version. This was originally 
uh, pivotal container services. Now, VMware um, got this product back into their portfolio because they reacquired Pivotal. Remember, Pivotal was spun out of VMware originally, many years ago, was recently reacquired. And so they also acquired Pivotal's managed Kubernetes solution. It has now been rebranded as Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Integrated Edition. We abbreviate that one as TKGI. And these are the three versions we're gonna dig into. Now, this is a high level overview of the, the different things that these that make these um, solutions different from each other. VMware, um, when it comes to TKG, they don't really like talking about these different TKG versions per se. Um, they often gloss over the difference between TKGM and TKGS. What VMware likes to discuss are capabilities. Um, but the devil is in the details. And when you have to support solutions like this, um, understanding which technologies exactly are behind certain capabilities um, becomes very important. So hence, I've made a number of tables like this that show you where these differences actually are. Um, as you can see, um, these different parts of what uh, TKG um, does and how it works, they differ. Um, sometimes quite significantly between these three versions. Now in this, in this slide, a TKGI, the oldest version is on the left. Um, it uses very different mechanisms to do its thing than the, other, than, than the other two, than TKGM and TKGS. TKGM and TKGS are far more alike um, in that way. In fact, they're more alike than they are different to each other but they are both very different to the older TKGI. TKGI uses very different technology to do things, different tools, different integrations. Um, interesting thing to point out in this slide is um, you'll notice that not every version is greater than SXT. Uh, VMware um, is, an interesting, is an interesting place when it comes to network support. They, to get Kubernetes running, you need a lot of networking stuff around it. And, the big networking product that VMware always had was NSXT. Um, yet in TKGM, there is no integration with NSXT. So TKGM and TKGS are very similar because they share the same core technology. This core technology is built around something called Cluster API. Now Cluster API is a open source sub project of the Kubernetes project, to, to kind of put it simply. Um, it is an initiative to enable Kubernetes to be able to spawn additional Kubernetes clusters. In the slide, I jokingly say how to make a Kubernetes cluster have babies, because that's basically what's going on. Another way of looking at it is, is saying this is Kubernetes inception, which is also true. Um, cluster API, um, tries to make the whole way a Kubernetes cluster is defined a very standard thing. And it tries to define it in the same language and the same object types as anything else that you would run in Kubernetes. And this is a trend that's actually, um, that, that's uh, hitting a lot of different things. You can define many different types of objects in Kubernetes. It doesn't need to have, have to be a pod or a container per se. It doesn't need to just be another Kubernetes cluster. You can define VMs in Kubernetes. You can define anything in Kubernetes. And that gives the ability to manage anything in Kubernetes. A very powerful capability. I'm going to see a lot more exotic uses of, K of Kubernetes to control things outside of itself um, through defining them as Kubernetes native objects. So. When, when you have Kubernetes, you run a container um, in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, it's called a pod. It's encapsulated in an object called a pod. Um, and your pod can contain some application logic, um, a part of your microservices application, say the front end or the back end or the, another part of it. Um, in TKGI and in TKGM, um, the, the topology you use, the flavor you use to, to, to deploy 
to get to the point where you can deploy workload pods is uh, the same. You, you have the control plane. In the case of TKGM, it's the management cluster. Then you create a workload Kubernetes cluster, a cluster that is dedicated to actually run your or your customer's actual you know, application containers in, and that's it. In TKGS, you actually have two options, which is a bit weird. You can do the same thing. You can spawn a complete Kubernetes cluster. We call these Tanzu Kubernetes clusters, TKCs for short. And then you run the workload containers in that. But in TKGS, and this was kind of the heart of Project Pacific, you can do something else, something interesting. You can run these pods natively directly on ESX. So that's kind of weird. Instead of, instead of having a dedicated Kubernetes cluster, your ESX hosts become the cluster and you run workload pods directly on ESX. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll have a close look at that in a second. Let's uh, look at the different TKG versions in a bit more depth now. We'll start with the oldest, which is TKGI. So like I said, TKGI was reacquired through the Pivotal acquisition. It predates uh, Tanzu. Um, it is uh, quite an early managed Kubernetes distribution. Um, and it's funny because timelines are all compressed in the Kubernetes world. It was actually first released, the first GA version was 2018, which is actually not that long ago. I uh, copy pasted this table straight from the TKGI documentation because it's, um, it's actually a nice example of, of what, what's meant by a managed Kubernetes solution. You know, what does a solution like this that you, you know, pay money for, what does it add to just vanilla Kubernetes? Well, this table nicely shows what TKGI adds to just vanilla Kubernetes. Um, so Pivotal um, have their own framework in which their software is installed, not just Tanzu Kubernetes Grid integrated, not just PKS as it was called, but also products like PCF, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and many other products in their marketplace, they were all installed uh, inside their managed framework. Um, and they have their own download site, their own marketplace. And um, even though they've been reacquired by VMware, these constructs and their way of doing things are still remains the same to this day. So if we look at the, the way TKGI is built up, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth here, um, but TKGI requires a, a bunch of different VMs as a control plane. Um, the way it uh, pushes out workloads into vSphere is it uses a technology called Bosch. Um, so Bosch is a way of creating VMs and putting content inside them. Um, and Pivotal had developed this over years, long before Kubernetes came along. Um, and they, um, actually I have to say, Bosch is an open source project, right? So it's not proprietary for Pivotal, but um, Pivotal productized commercialized Bosch and Cloud Foundry, and later Kubernetes. Um, and they created a management layer around it to make it really easy to use. Um, in this case, Bosch is the thing that installs Kubernetes, manages the VMs, is the thing that talks to vSphere. If you look on the left here, um, this is um, simply what, the, what their basic command line tool actually does. And it's interesting because it's a nice example of all the kind of stuff you would expect from a managed Kubernetes solution. Create a cluster, delete a cluster, customize a cluster. If we look at the, um, the interface of their management framework, um, you install Tanzu Kubernetes Grid as what's called a product tile inside a, an appliance called Ops Manager. It used to be Pivotal Ops Manager or just Ops Manager. Now it's called Tanzu Ops Manager. Um, and it's an appliance that basically manages all this stuff for you, very easy to use. Uh, TKGI depends very heavily on NSXT. Um, you can run it without NSXT, um, but then you lose a lot of capabilities, a lot of automation. Um, it uses NSXT and creates and manages all of the NSXT objects that it needs to do the Kubernetes or the networking around Kubernetes. When you deploy TKGI on vSphere, 
um, this is kind of what it looks like in vSphere. Creates a lot of VMs. All the VMs have strange names. Um, they're all not being managed by you. You don't manage these anymore. They're all being managed in this case by Bosch. So that's all I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to cover with TKGI. Because um, the new stuff, the new hotness is TKG, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. I'm going to start with the core product, the standalone product called TKGM. Remember, M for multi cloud. So TKGM um, is, like I said, it's standalone. It can run basically um, anywhere you can run a VM. Uh, it does need to be able to talk to the EAS layer, to the cloud provider in this case. Um, but they uh, support many different clouds now. You can run TKGM on vSphere, of course, but also on Azure, on AWS, um, and uh, more clouds are being added uh, all the time. At, because it's standalone, it, it kind of has everything it needs to do its thing. So it doesn't require, in fact, it doesn't even support integrating with NSXT. Um, but it can't do everything on its own. You'll still need an external load balancer. Um, now, this is a role that in the other versions of TKG NSXT could provide. In this case, you'll have to have something else. Um, in the public cloud, of course, the public clouds themselves, they provide the load balancing function and many other network services that TKGM will use um, to, to do the load balancing it needs to get traffic into your cluster. In vSphere, however, you need something else. Um, you, you'll, you'll need to um, install something called the NSX Advanced Load Balancer. Or you can bring your own, but then it's not supported by VMware. But it would work, probably. So um, TKGM always starts with a management cluster. This is basically something that's prescribed by cluster API, by the way that it can then spawn additional workload clusters. So you always start with a management cluster. Um, and you'll see this reflected in TKGS, because remember, the TKGM is kind of inside TKGS, but it's all wrapped up and more customized. So, the installation process for TKGM is interesting. Um, it's doing, again, a bit of a Kubernetes inception thing. When you install it, um, when you run the installer, what it actually does is it starts a Kubernetes cluster on the place you run the installer, which could be your laptop, or it could be um, a jump host. Um, this is called the bootstrap machine. Um, it's probably recommended that this isn't your laptop in production. It's probably recommended that you, you dedicate a, a jump box VM for this purpose. Um, it spins up a small Kubernetes cluster on that machine um, in Docker, so it requires Docker. It then fills that Kubernetes cluster with everything it needs to actually spawn additional Kubernetes clusters. So it's actually doing what the product will end up doing. Um, creating a management cluster to spawn additional clusters. We call this first cluster the bootstrap cluster. And once it's done installing the actual management cluster, the bootstrap cluster goes away again. We give the bootstrap cluster this configuration file to tell it what our management cluster is going to look like. And this is a very simple, it's a YAML file, but it's a very simple key value file, really. It's very flat, um, and it just it just gives TKGM what it needs to build a cluster, any cluster. It doesn't have to be a management cluster. You'll see that in a second. When you run the installation, um, or you have two options. You can run it in the UI. It'll open a browser window, um, and, um, and it'll show you exactly where it is, and it'll show the live logs as it's going. Or you can run it straight CLI mode, no UI, no, no browser node needed. Um, and then it'll just pump out what it's doing on the command line. Um, quite a verbose, uh, pretty good, but um, 
and that's that's somewhat where the troubleshooting ease of use ends. <laughs> I'll get into, that, get into that in a second. Um, once you have your management cluster running, uh, you can then spawn additional clusters. And you use basically the same configuration file you would use to create the original management cluster. You just give it a few, few different values, you know, two or three, and you can already spawn an additional workload cluster, the clusters that you'll actually be using to run your or your customers' workloads in. Um, when you spawn these clusters, they're just VMs. Um, the management cluster is talking to vSphere, so it's in charge of creating the VMs, of using um, a template that you that you need to provide. It's basically an OVA that you either download from VMware or you can roll your own. There are instructions for this. Um, which ones are supported? It depends on which licensed version of a Tanzu edition you have, but um, you can you can use your own OVA. But in the end, it's just VMs. So you end up with a pretty flat um, bunch of VMs. They're running Kubernetes clusters inside. But to vSphere, they're just VMs. A vSphere, in the case of TKGM, has no way of seeing what's going on inside those clusters. Now, TKGS is quite different. TKGS takes the core technology of TKGM, embeds it in vSphere, and that enables some extra capabilities. Um, first of all, like I said, you have this option. You can run um, containers directly on ESX, or you can simply do the same as in TKGM and spawn workload, dedicated workload clusters, Tanzu, Kubernetes clusters, and run the containers in those. So you can do go both ways. Um, TKGS, um, since, uh, since a very recent update, it's also uh, exposes the ability to actually have it create um, just VMs for you. I mean, it had to already be able to do this, otherwise it can't create the VMs that Kubernetes is running in, right? Um, but they've recently actually exposed this, so now you can actually create your own VMs, which is very interesting. Um, I mean, if you don't already have something like vRealize Automation, this might be a nice alternative. It's still very new though. It's still experimental right now. Another interesting thing about TKGS, it, it, it um, introduces the concept of namespaces in vSphere, in the vSphere UI. Namespaces are basically resource pools with a bunch of Kubernetes integration tagged onto it. They're basically just resource pools though. Um, but you can also, you can use them to manage access to different Kubernetes namespaces inside the management cluster. And you can do a bunch of other things with them, like set limits on them. So here's, um, here's kind of what it starts to look like in the vSphere UI when you enable um, TKGS, which they call workload enablement. Um, it allows you to then create namespace, and within those namespaces, you can um, either directly deploy um, containers into your directly onto your ESX hosts, or you can do the same as in TKGM and spawn a dedicated cluster um, to run the workloads in those. In the former case, when you run pods directly on vSphere, a lot of information around those pods becomes visible in the vSphere UI. But if you instead do the intermediate layer and first install a TKC, a Tanzu Kubernetes cluster, then, um, then those become just VMs for vSphere. You know, vSphere can't look into them any deeper. So then you run containers in those and those won't pop up in the vSphere UI. So there is a difference in visibility. Now, just briefly about these, um, these vSphere namespaces. They're interesting because they allow a kind of way of tenanting out um, how you, uh, you know, how you do either it allows you to tenant out namespaces within within Kubernetes, or um, or uh, you can, you know, if you if you create these Tanzu guest clusters, these Tanzu Kubernetes clusters, it allows you to um, to segment those out to different teams, to different people. Um, so namespaces are a kind of a tenant light solution that's built into this, um, into TKGS. Now, I'll just show you this slide again, because I just want to focus again on this dual option we have. It's very important. You can roll out TKC clusters, or you can run the workloads directly on ESX. 
Now, that can be interesting because it makes all those parts more visible, but you have to be careful because running those parts in, on ESX directly, the project Pacific part of TKGS, um, it's not actually a real Kubernetes cluster. I mean, it kind of is, it acts that way. What I mean is it's not conformant. It's not conformant to the specifications laid out by the um, Kubernetes project. That means things will break, or well, they can break, but my experience is things do break. Um, because it's, it's a kind of a weird kind of custom Kubernetes environment, um, not everything will work in it correctly. So if you decide to use it, there are some advantages to using it. You can have deep integration with NSXT, which you don't have otherwise, um, yeah, more visibility. But the downside is some things might not work properly or work as expected. So if you run those workloads in embedded mode, test your workloads very, very carefully. Don't assume it's a normal Kubernetes cluster because it's not. Um, just be very careful. Now, when you install TKGS, what you actually do is you take a, a, an ESX cluster, a vSphere cluster, and you, in, do, you enable workload management on it. That's their term for turning on all of these TKG bits in, inside vSphere. Um, it's basically just a wizard you run through and you give it all the information. Um, so, so interestingly, there is no CLI version of this. It's just the, 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 ground, the UI wizard in the vSphere UI. You go through the wizard, this will create the TKGS equivalent of a TKGM management cluster, but in TKGS parlance, we call it the supervisor cluster, but it serves the same purpose. So when you do this, this is kind of what it starts to look like. You have your ESX hosts, which now play a double role. They're also your Kubernetes worker nodes. You have supervisor cluster, which is the management plane for, for the TKGS um, or it's the management server, the management Kubernetes cluster for TKGS. You can run pods directly. It's in the next screenshot actually on the next page, or you can roll out a TKC cluster and that's what you see here. Um, this is what it looks like when you're running those embedded pods. Um, you'll see them pop up as if they are VMs, really. Okay, finally, just to round this out, here's some networking considerations for you. These three different versions of TKG, they're not all the same and they support different types of networking options. These details are important. And remember, you can review all these slides later and this session is being recorded. So it'll be available on YouTube. But um, so you can review all this information. The point is that there are differences in which networking options are available to you and which projects, products you can use in these different versions of TKG and which versions are supported by VMware. It's also important. And of course, from a licensing perspective, not all of these things are equally licensed among the different Tanzu editions. So keep that in mind. But there are basically, to kind of, to, to simplify it, there are basically two products that you'll be using for the networking around TKG. The first is, of course, NSXT, integrates very deeply with TKGI and integrates deeply with TKGS, but only when you run those pods directly on ESX. If you spawn just a normal Tanzu Kubernetes guest cluster, there is no TK NSXT integration at all. So you have to be careful, you know, if you do that, what are you going to use there for low balancing? You might have to roll your own or install the other product that's supported for Kubernetes networking things, which is the newer product, NSX Advanced Load Balancer. Um, this is an acquisition. It's a standalone product. It's, um, so it's not as integrated as NSXT, but it's quite mature and it's extremely intuitive to use. I'm a big fan of it. Um, this thing can do more or less everything you need around Kubernetes as well. And this is the other option you'll get in many of these uh, versions of TKG. In fact, in TKGM, it's the only supported version you have uh, to, uh, to do the load balancing around, um, around those TKGM clusters. Um, and this is just an illustration of how kind of um, 
uh, it's very, NSX ALB is a very flexible. It's just a bunch of VMs. So you're very flexible in where you place which bits. Um, it also scales very differently, in, in my opinion, more efficiently than, than NSXT with its, with its edges. Um, so, um, and it, this runs on a straight VCS switch. You don't need anything else. So this is, um, this is a, a very nice alternative to doing the, uh, the low balancing um, uh, for TKG, uh, for TKGS and TKGM. Uh, this does not work with TKGI. So just to summarize, TKGM and TKGS are the, the new guys on the block, they're the new versions. They're still quite new. They're still under active development. So things continuously change. That can make it hard to, to decide on which version to use. Um, TKGI is the more mature option, but as TKGM and TKGS achieve feature parity with TKGI, at some point TKGI is gonna go away. So it might not be a great idea to invest in that right now. In fact, I don't think you can even buy it anymore, but there are still a hell of a lot of people using it today. Um, TKGS and TKGM are slightly are quite different, but they have the same core. One could wonder if it makes sense to have these two different versions, whether VMware wouldn't be better off just having one version of this. Um, and TKGS and TKGM, finally, they sit very close to, to, to Kubernetes. Um, the way they work is based on cluster API, you know, this, this sub-project of the Kubernetes project. So in order to troubleshoot them, in order to actually use them properly, you need to really know Kubernetes well, um, which can be a challenge for, uh, for some of us who are coming from that vSphere world. Anyway, that's it. I want to thank you for your time. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I, lo I love giving people one-on-ones uh, in this material. Um, thank you for your time.